Message to the Black Man in America by the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Forward The Truth About Muhammad. It has been more than 40 years since a Negro has appeared on the national horizon of racial leadership with a program for his people as controversial. And as clear cut as that of Elijah Muhammad. Not since the days of Marcus Garvey, the West Indian visionary, back in 1920, has an either or else plan of Negro salvation been placed before the people that is as sharply outlined as to consequences as that of Muhammad. Garvey's Back to Africa slogan, based solely on vivid black nationalism, electrified Negroes to the point where more than five million joined his ranks and deified the pudgy black man whom they worshiped with their love and their loyalty. His Universal Negro Improvement Association. That eventually spread throughout the world, wherever black people are found, was primarily a mass movement designed to absorb the little man. This is also true of Elijah Muhammad's Temples of Islam. His movement is based solidly on awakening the great masses of America's. 20 million Negroes to the truth of their racial heritage and destiny. Like Marcus Garvey, Muhammad is building his religious group on a non white basis, and like Garvey, has irrefutable reasons for excluding whites. Muhammad was born the son of a rural Georgia minister. He learned only The bare rudiments of reading, writing, and arithmetic before he had to go to the fields to help his family earn a living. But Muhammad, born Elijah Poole, under the slave name of his parents, as Garvey had been before him, was particularly fitted to be a teacher of men, not in the sense. Of the popular conception of classroom teachers of rote and dogma, but in the classic molds of the great teachers of history Socrates, Aristotle, Siddhartha Gautama, the Buddha, Guru Nanak, Kung Fu Tse, Confucius, Zoroaster, Moses, Muhammad, and Jesus Christ. Most of whom were largely unlettered men. They taught the truth of life in its practical essence, taking the torch of mental freedom among the great masses of mankind, and thus enlightening the world of their day. They persisted in spreading their momentary glimpses of the truth to all mankind. In the face of the murderous opposition of the priesthood, the hostility of kings, and the general unwillingness of men to hear the error of their ways. These men were known as priests, as rabbis, as teachers. Some were believed to be gods in disguise. Whatever the popular thinking about their true identity, What they taught and the good they brought to the world was of greater import and impact. The dramatic, spectacular climb of Muhammad from a sharecropper's cotton patch in Sandersville, Georgia, to national and international eminence as a leader of his people is one that must be told at another time. The Muslim name, Muhammad, 
was given him over 30 years ago by his own teacher in the Islamic faith. Today, Muhammad says God's goal is to give all my people holy names to replace those given them by the slave master, whites, while they were in physical and mental bondage in America. He points out that the names his followers are known by are just as legal as those given them by the white man or adopted by the descendants of former slaves. Muhammad himself was known as Kareem before he was called Muhammad. Kareem, he says, is the original name the Prophet Muhammad was known by 1,400 years ago. There are more than 100 praiseworthy holy names for God or good, which people in Islam are known by, he says. But white people frequently take the names of beasts, such as bear, hog, fox, or bull, or of marine creatures, such as fish, salmon, and so forth. By giving Negroes such names, the white man perpetuates his rule of the black man. A characteristic of Muhammad's teachings is that he never, as Garvey and others did before him, preached back to Africa doctrines as the salvation of the American so-called Negro. Muhammad says America is not the white man's home. He belongs in Europe and by force took America from our Asiatic brother, the Indian. We have as much right to this soil as the white man. Why should we claim the land of our black brother in Africa, for which he has given his life and labor? It belongs to him. Our destiny, he points out, is right here in America. Right now, Muhammad is nearing that crossroad of all leaders where the value and extent of his teachings are on trial. Is Golgotha his destination? Will his own people sell him out as they sold out Marcus Garvey and Booger T. Washington? Can he be destroyed, toppled by jealous rivals, picked to pieces by other enemies, bent on reducing him to size? These are explosive questions that should be examined in the light of the consistent drive to discredit the mild-mannered, soft-spoken, slightly-built little man who directs an unprecedented nationwide all-Negro movement based on the teachings of Islam. Submission to the commands of Allah the God of the Muslims. Wherever black men and women are found in the United States, his followers point out there are followers of Elijah Muhammad, the messenger of Allah. Branch mosques of Islam are flourishing in Detroit, Boston, New York, Baltimore, Washington, Philadelphia, St. Louis, Pittsburgh, Norfolk, Winston-Salem, Newark, Cleveland, Indianapolis, Milwaukee, Chicago, Atlanta, Houston, Birmingham, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Miami, Jacksonville, Macon, and perhaps another hundred cities towns, and villages. 
as one Muhammad official in Detroit said recently, every time a Negro is beaten by white mobs or police, a Negro's home is burned, a cross is planted on a Negro's lawn, or a black man is refused service at a lunch counter, gas station, or hotel. You can count on a minimum of 200 Negroes joining our movement the next day. Among us, they finally find refuge in the company of their people, their own kind, who know where they are going. With membership swelling in such proportions, respect and alarm is growing over the Muhammad movement among both upper level whites and Negroes. The Negroes opposing Muhammad are mostly those ed on to it by personal jealousy or motivated by their own white sponsors. Who must not be offended or denied unless they have the ground cut from under them in politics, business, or social circles. The Negro preachers, while privately agreeing with Muhammad's teachings, are almost to a man afraid to speak up and be identified. They use The traditional ideological opposition of Christianity to Islam as their escape hatch. Yet, in spite of this vast chasm, so far not spanned by followers of either faith, some Negro ministers are speaking up in defense of their convictions that Muhammad deserves to be heard. These are those courageous ministers who have not been afraid to make available their church auditoriums for Muhammad rallies and conventions in Chicago, Detroit, Cleveland, Philadelphia, Los Angeles, and elsewhere. The man is teaching the truth, whether he says he gets it from the Christian God. Or the Muslim Allah. One minister said this in Cleveland, where a recent Muhammad rally attracted 3,000 persons in a heavy rain to the Cory Methodist Church to hear the fiery leader of America's Muslims speak. To a man, however, Negro ministers, social agency leaders, And politicians will assure you there's nothing communistic about the Muhammad phenomenon. But most of them are prone to label the spread of the Islamic doctrine as espoused by Muhammad as a form of extreme black nationalism. Others call it black supremacy. Actually, Muhammad is exposing Negroes for the first time to a brutal appraisal of their actual standing in the American community and what they can expect in the future from a system that, under various disguises, still grips them in mental, physical, and moral slavery. And after 100 years of alleged freedom, From the clanking shackles of Southern plantation servitude, continues to lull them to sleep with false promises of a bright tomorrow which never comes. The fight against Muhammad has united Negro and white in a bond of common unity seldom achieved in the past, most certainly not against. The Ku Klux Klan, the white citizens' councils, the avowed proponents of white supremacy, and the states, rights, and conservatives, who, ever since 
Abraham Lincoln issued his Emancipation Proclamation freeing the slaves have labored without let up to return the black man to actual physical slavery in the South and then deny him the meager, hard earned, and costly freedoms he has won in the courts. Through the Christian Church, these bitter foes of Muhammad and the Negro have established as a disgraceful worldwide criterion of Christianity the saying, 11 o'clock on Sunday is America's most segregated hour. To change this, Negroes are being egged into pitiful kneel in demonstrations at lily white churches in both the North and South, making such debasing spectacles of themselves in order to be admitted to a house of worship to bow down to the same God the white man claims has ordered him to keep black people out. But Muhammad, who doesn't admit whites to his spiritual meetings in his mosque on Sunday, is bitterly accused of practicing race hatred because he does not believe it helps the Negro's cause to let the white man in on everything he does or thinks. Compounding this unreasoning hatred and opposition to Muhammad is the fact that so many Negro so-called leaders have jumped on the white bandwagon trying to drown out Muhammad's bitter truths. They speak at every rally and meeting in which he appears. Actually, the fight on Muhammad and his program can be summed up on the issues listed here. They oppose him because 1. The truth he teaches is too unpleasant to hear and the complacent, both Negro and white, don't want to hear it, nor do they want anyone else to hear it. 2. He stirs up the masses of Negroes in a way no one since the heyday of Marcus Garvey has done in telling them to stand up and be men. 3. They cannot break up his ever-growing following without starting major race riots and other outbreaks which would be political suicide for any official to attempt at this time or at any time in the future. 4. Muhammad is independent. No white money backs him. No white man calls the shots as to what his organization can demand from him as an accounting of his stewardship. This he says simply, he owes only to his own people. 5. He teaches race solidarity and unity. He preaches that the number one motto of black people everywhere must be all for one and one for all. If the race is to lift itself by its own bootstraps from the mess of ignorance and slavery it is in today. Six, he sees what others cannot see. Unlettered as he is, Elijah Muhammad has the uncanny but God-given ability to accurately prophesy about the future. His knowledge of the true history of the world's black people is awesome and comes from years of concentrated study and research. That is why he is called 
the messenger of Allah. Seven, he steps on too many toes. Truth is impersonal and a two-edged sword, cutting down the lies, deceits, and half-truths with equally emphatic swipes on all sides. Muhammad tears the veil of falsehood aside and exposes the phonies, the fearful, and the mountebanks among both Negroes and whites. Eight, he teaches Negroes to first love one another. This perhaps is the phase of his teachings that has aroused such widespread criticism that he teaches his people to hate the white man. Muhammad says, you won't have the capacity to love anybody else if you concentrate all your love on your fellow black man. If the white man shows so little love or even respect for the black man, he points out, why should Negroes spend so much time running around begging their brothers to love those who do not have the same measure of regard or love for blacks? Nine, he gives the little Negro true leadership. This tenet of Muhammad's credo is also widely seen as a source of the general jealousy of him held by Negro politicians, social workers, and some ministers. For until Muhammad came along, only an isolated Few Negro organizations, including churches, had the time of day for the largely illiterate, poverty-stricken, superstitious, exploited masses. Instead, the concentration was on improving the conditions of living of the high school and college-educated middle-class Negro. The well-to-do policy kings, and real estate insurance and funeral tycoons were wooed, and the nickel-and-dime Negroes shooed away to the tender mercies of storefront church preachers or sidewalk soapbox orators. 10. He has had the courage to open schools of his own in order to prepare young Negroes for what they must face and cope with in making a better world for themselves and their descendants. Up to the day he opened his first University of Islam in Detroit, the only Negro-owned and operated schools and colleges were backed by such church groups as the African Methodist Episcopals, the Baptists, and a few other denominations. Muhammad's universities in Detroit, Chicago, and elsewhere have highly trained faculties and are distinguished by the fact that children in the third grade are speaking Arabic fluently and working difficult problems in algebra. 11. He lifts up Negro women and removes them from the status of being prostitutes for white men. This startling development in the Muhammad program is unprecedented for scarlet women saved by the churches always carry the stinging distinction of their former lives. Muhammad relieves them of all disgrace and gives them a new life based on purity and self-respect. At the same time, he makes it mandatory that his male followers honor their own women as individual examples of virtue. 12. He goes among the fallen of his people 
and redeems the wino, the alcoholic, the narcotics addict, the prostitute, the sidewalk hoodlum, the thief, and the profane. A visit to any Muhammad Mosque of Islam will reward the student seeking to see for himself. Calm, quiet. Self-contained efficiency and pride is seen on every hand. No singing of spirituals and gospel songs, or loud shouting, or amens, and groans disturb his service. His followers acknowledge his or his assistants scoring of points with hand applause only. More white writers. Arthurs and journalists are writing about Elijah Muhammad and his Mosque of Islam movement, who have never met, heard, or talked to him than any black man in recent history, because they have never met or talked in person with the man. Most of these writers, for national magazines and newspapers. Take a hostile attitude toward him, almost to a man. They accuse Muhammad of teaching his followers to hate the white man, condemn him severely for racism, and allege he is teaching black supremacy. Few write that Muhammad is teaching black people to love themselves and their race first. Nor do they point out that any person or people thus engaged have little or no time to go around loving everybody, turning the other cheek, and otherwise wasting valuable effort and time that today keeps the black man on the bottom rung of the ladder. They fail to point out. That Jesus Christ failed to teach humanity to love the man or men who beat, kill, or enslave it, or to hop spryly about with grinning lips when the enslaver heaves into view, anxious to serve and make him happy, even though the slave is still in chains, economic, political. And social. These writers view with alarm, and seem perturbed, that Muhammad's irrefutable logic tells his followers the truth: that as a race, they are third class in the white man's political and economic system, and not to be content with partial freedom, with the gloomy promise. That some distant day, in the future, the so-called Negro will be completely free at last. None has the courage to ask why this freedom isn't given to the black man now, from fear of life, limb, property, and mind, since the dominant whites have the power to give. Or withhold it. They never say much about the fact that white supremacy has been, and still is, the basis of Western world power politics, or that it is present in all phases of American and European life. Yet Muhammad is condemned and looked upon. As some kind of social criminal, because he has the rare courage to tell his people and the world that there is such a thing as a supreme black man. To these writers, black supremacy sounds like a foul, sinister plot to liberate some fierce, ferocious black animals. On an unsuspecting, innocent white world, they assert that this black supremacy doctrine 
Muhammad teaches is all wrong. But they themselves never put the white man in a secondary position that is reserved for the blacks. The black man, they imply, could never make it alone without the support and help of the white man. As an example of this type of thinking, the late syndicate colonist Robert Ruark said darkly that the new black African nations will fall apart in internecine and tribal wars, petty jealousies, ignorance, and primitive passions because they are chasing the white men out after all these centuries of colonial exploitation. One can detect in reports from South Africa in the daily papers and magazines the natural fears of the Western world that the blacks will at last gain their freedom and take over the rulership of their own land. This, many writers describe in left-handed terms, will be an awful calamity. And as soon as the whites leave their modern structures and the ever-stocked trough at which they have been stuffing themselves ever since they subjected Africa, the whole house will come tumbling down. Such thinking argues that black men need the white supremacy symbol even if it is only to save them from themselves. But for Elijah Muhammad to spell out the facts of the matter and arouse his people to glowing pride in their newly given knowledge that there can be such a creature as a supreme black man or black race is akin to treason in the eyes of these self-appointed guardians of the black man's thoughts and racial destiny. What strikes me as most encouraging is the fact that Muhammad's aloofness and unavailability to these white writers, authors, and radio and television commentators has, for the first time, presented to America a black leader who has the ability, the power, and desire to stay out of their clutches. So-called Negro leaders, the Negro press, and others who have been brainwashed for so many centuries think it a high crime that Muhammad doesn't run and tell the whites what he is doing every day or let them infiltrate his meetings and conferences where he is carrying on his work of trying to teach his people self-respect and self-reliance and point out the pitfalls around them, whether physical or mental. When Raymond Moley, Harry Ashmore, the editors of Time Magazine, and the Stooge, Negro reporters for white papers, sent into Muhammad meetings to stool pigeon for the whites who are not admitted, tried to compare the Mosque of Islam movement with the white supremacy Ku Klux Klan or the white councils of both the South and North. They do not explain why they are not campaigning as assiduously to break up the Klan and councils in their writings as they are in seeking the disintegration of the movement started by Muhammad. Meanwhile, in spite of all attempts by police and federal authorities to block the growth of the Mosque of Islam or to shut Muhammad's mouth, the religion is rapidly mushrooming 
into perhaps the largest all-Black movement on the North American continent. Wherever the brilliant, sincere, dedicated, mild-mannered little man is heard, or people read his writings, new converts are coming forth to be counted among the chosen. They have learned that there is no white man alive who can and will tell the so-called Negro what he actually wants, and none will tell him truthfully how to get it. But Muhammad not only knows the aims and desires of his people, but he also knows the means to get it and the quickest way to come into possession of this fundamental truth about the black man's true self and destiny. For most persons, the general conception of a Negro leader runs something like this. In size, he is big and imposing and has a fat, well-fed appearance. He wears expensive clothes and is always immaculate. He smokes big fat cigars and makes it part of his daily routine to be seen dining in the more popular restaurants and cafes. He is typed by the costly liquors he orders, the make of automobile he drives, and the wide swath he cuts at interracial parties and affairs where the black and white sit down to talk this thing over. Whenever he is mentioned in the newspapers, the writer has to include much of his biography to inform readers who he is and what he means. Such biographical material detailing his school and college background, his employment record, especially in government or social work or teaching, and the various honors he has received, such as awards and honorary appointments since he first entered public life. On the other hand, you don't read biographical stuff on Elijah Muhammad as a means of introducing him to readers. That is, unless the story is printed in a white paper, which generally goes out of its way to reiterate the paper's view of the spiritual leader of America's 250,000 Muslims as being head of a black supremacy cult that preaches hate the white man doctrines to its Negro followers. You won't find any newspaper recording the presence of Elijah Muhammad at any kind of cocktail party because he preaches against the use of liquor in any form. He does not participate in interracial socializing because he believes the Negro weakens himself morally as well as spiritually by breaking his neck to get into the company of white persons. And Muhammad does not smoke. Instead, he admonishes his followers against the use of tobacco or any narcotics. In size, Elijah Muhammad stands a 12 foot, 5 feet, 6 inches. For what he might lack in height, he makes up an inner power and dedication to what to him is a 20th century holy crusade to deliver the black man from his present economic, political, and social shackles. He weighs a modest 150 pounds and, in his mid-60s, is in consistently 
perfect physical condition. Those who have had the rare privilege of visiting him at his home in Hyde Park agree that he presents the picture of a sober, noble father of a well-beloved family. It is the dwelling of a dedicated man surrounded by a family also dedicated to the salvation of a race of people. In an atmosphere of profound quiet, Mr. Muhammad's day begins at 7.30 a.m. Until late at night, he dictates letters, speeches, newspaper columns, and articles to his four highly competent young secretaries. During his day, starting at the breakfast table, he opens and reads every one of the more than 300 letters he receives daily from Muslim leaders in Europe, Asia, Africa, and South America. All mail is answered. Mr. Muhammad's speeches are prepared for personal delivery in his weekly speaking engagements in cities around the nation or for his program on radio stations all over the country. His busy day also includes conferences with Negro businessmen and ministers and with officials of his various mosques who fly in and out of Chicago seven days of the week to take counsel with him. Very unique in the history of American Negro leadership is the origination of a program that is established on a premise of what Negroes can do for themselves without support from white people. A program that fires the latent embers of intense black nationalism with a clear-cut, glorious goal as its ultimate objective. Accordingly, Marcus Garvey, with his Back to Africa exhortations during the early 1920s and his nationwide phalanx of five million black followers in his Universal Negro Improvement Association electrified the black world of America's Negro masses as no other movement up to his time. The same results have been evident since Elijah Muhammad introduced his beneficial Temples of Islam. His bold demands that black folk throw off the shackles of the white man's Christianity and return to Islam, the religion of our ancestors, has brought Negroes from all levels swarming to his banner. Admittedly, an unlettered man, the tiny, spiritual leader of the fast-growing Muslim movement in the Western Hemisphere, nonetheless has self-authored more literature of his own views of his program than any of his predecessors in Negro leadership. Week after week, his flaming, controversial newspaper columns and prominent Negro weeklies and his own newspaper, Muhammad Speaks, and thousands of sermons recorded for radio delivery on miles of tape are unprecedented in Negro organizational literature. Not even Garvey, with his giant weekly newspaper, The Negro World, with a peak circulation in 1921 of more than 800,000 copies comes close 
to the personal output of words of the indefatigable Mr. Muhammad. For most of the Negro world was devoted to articles, editorials, and news stories written by others with comparatively very little from the pen of Garvey himself. If ever correlated and put into book form, the writings of Elijah Muhammad to date would, at a conservative estimate, make a minimum of two dozen of volumes. And Muhammad's writings, despite his lack of formal education, are built on separate words designed for permanency. Every word in his writings is fashioned with loving care and a supreme regard for truth. What he writes is told in the language of the little fellow so there can be no mistake or confusion of purpose or shades of meaning. This phase of his writing habits is undertaken daily with the help of highly trained and dedicated young women secretaries. The Messenger of Allah is meticulous about what he writes and insists that not a word be changed when his final drafts are completed. The result is that what he says is unmistakable for what he puts on paper is exactly what he wants to convey. And there is the core of what makes his program for the salvation of the American black man so comprehensible and beneficial. Readers, whether or not they agree with him, are forced to admit that man is telling us the truth. Daniel Burley Obey divine messengers. And we sent no messenger, but that he should be obeyed by Allah's command. Holy Quran, chapter 4, verse 64. The so-called American Negroes have never had a divine messenger sent to them before the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Therefore, there will be much opposition to him from his people who want to lead and not be followers of others, especially the middle class, the black Christian preachers, and the college and university students who feel so proud of their worldly education and positions. They think their worldly learning and high positions with the enemies of God will protect them against following the divine messenger of God. Wait and see. The so-called Negroes should not be this type of people since they have the Bible, which is full of prophecies concerning the fate of those who rejected and opposed God's prophets. Allah's warning in the Holy Quran is very plain against the disobedient and opposers to his last apostle. And he whom God has caused to arise among the so-called Negroes to be his apostle is most surely the last apostle and the last person to whom the divine revelation and guidance is to come. This is the time the Bible and Holy Quran refer to as the resurrection of the dead, mentally dead, or ignorant people whom God wishes to make wise and set over the nations by his guidance and his infinite wisdom. 
after listening to what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was taught by Allah, there's nothing left for another messenger to teach us of self, God, and the devil. Messenger Elijah Muhammad's message to us fulfills the Bible and Holy Quran for the last messenger's message is to bring us face to face with the knowledge of God and the devils that we may make our choice as to whom we shall serve. The other divine teaching the messenger says is that which guides us into the hereafter. I say anyone who ignores Messenger Elijah Muhammad's teaching is in danger of hellfire. The Holy Quran warns us against imputing sin to Allah's messengers. Though the Bible and Holy Quran hold no one sinless, but the Holy Quran teaches us that Allah is sufficient as a judge for his apostles, and the Bible verifies this. We just cannot be the judges of divine messengers. Obeying them is what Allah warns us to do. The messenger teaches us that Allah warned him against taking up the enemy's arms against the enemy. Allah's orders to Messenger Elijah Muhammad are the same as those given to the prophets of old. Moses had only a rod. Noah had nothing but the word. Lot had nothing but the word. And Messenger Elijah Muhammad has nothing but word of Allah against the arms of the police. In Detroit, in April 1934, and in Chicago, on April 2nd, 1935, a law slew the police captain in the police courtroom who was trying one of Messenger Muhammad's followers. There was a display of firearms by the police against the unarmed group of Muslim men and women. Allah showed who should be killed. Messenger Elijah Muhammad puts his trust in Allah. I am sorry for the poor fools who refuse to trust the God of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Messenger Muhammad teaches us to follow the way of Allah. Some may think that Messenger Elijah Muhammad may be jealous, but this cannot be, for no one can take the place of a divine messenger. They are chosen by God and not by the people. We just cannot take a messenger's place unless God makes us as he did them. For such a one is made of God and not of himself or the world. Regardless as to how much worldly education one may have, he cannot make himself the messenger of God unless God wants him to be and re-educates him divinely. If Allah has chosen the Honorable Elijah Muhammad to be his apostle, there is not another so-called Negro in the world who can take his place, regardless of what we may think of him. You cannot force yourself on God for such office. The Holy Quran 
teaches us that the angels cannot say anything after Allah makes his choice of an apostle. We may say that he is not fit for a messenger. In the Holy Quran, chapter 75, verse 37 through 40, and chapter 76, verse 1 through 3, Moses complained of not being able to speak plainly or eloquently. But that did not make God choose Aaron for his apostle, because Aaron was a better speaker than Moses. God told Moses he could use his brother for his prophet if he wanted to. But Allah said to Moses, You are my prophet, and I am going to send you to Pharaoh. There are many people, especially among the so-called Negroes, who want certain ones that we like to lead us. But God has his choice, and we can like his choice or not. It makes no difference with God. There's not a prophet of the past that the people in his time did not have something to say against. But whatever the people said, it did not change God's choice. What so-called Negro has been able to stop us from our evil ways and make us love each other so much that we will hug and kiss each other anywhere and not be ashamed? This love of the brotherhood makes us love and respect our women, makes them go modestly dressed we can hold 10,000 people, white and black, spellbound for two or three hours at any time. The person who leaves the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad makes himself a fool. The advice to all our people is get on to your own kind. This world is at hand. Minister James Shabazz, Muhammad's Temple of Islam, number two, Chicago, Illinois. Purchase the books, CDs, and DVDs of the life giving teachings at store.finalcall.com. Listen to the messages of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan 24 7 at finalcallradio.com. Watch the Nation of Islam's weekly and live broadcasts at NOI.org.